This program is paid for by the friends and partners of Touching Lives. Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. Here at Touching Lives, our mission is to touch the lives of the lost and enrich the faith of the found. And now, here is pastor, author, and speaker, Dr. James Merritt. I want to thank you for being here, whether you're at our Sugarloaf campus or our Mill Creek campus or you're watching by live streaming and boys of technology we're excited about. All of you are listening today. I want to tell you a story about uh, a lady. Some of you may recognize her name. Her name is Dawn Smith Jordan. Dawn Smith Jordan was Miss South Carolina and was actually the first runner-up to Miss America in 1986. But an event took place in Dawn's life the year before that was uh, somewhat of an emotional and spiritual earthquake that shook her to the very core of her being. On May the 31st, 1985, her 17-year-old sister, Sherry, was kidnapped as she was walking from her car to their mailbox. They lived out in the country. They didn't hear anything from her for several days, didn't know where she was. She was just two days from graduating from high school. About five days after she was kidnapped, they received a letter in the mail, and it was from Sherry, and it was titled, My Last Will and Testament. And evidently, her kidnapper had informed her that he was going to kill her, but he allowed her to write this last letter to her parents and to her sister. And um, this is what it said. I love you all so much. Please don't let this ruin your lives. Just keep living one day at a time for Jesus. And please don't worry about me. I'm going to be with my father now. Love, Sherry. Five days later, her body was discovered. She had been tortured, repeatedly raped. She had been brutalized. She was finally strangled to death. But at least they had found her body. But the nightmare was far from over. Because not soon after her funeral, this killer, in a very sick way, began to call this family intermittently, sometime in the morning, sometime at night. And he would go into great pains to describe in detail how he had brutalized their daughter. He would go into detail about how he had raped her and sexually assaulted her and brutalized her. And then finally called and told them in detail how she had suffered while he was strangling her to death. He became the subject of the largest manhunt in South Carolina history. He was apprehended shortly thereafter, and he was sentenced to die in the electric chair. As a matter of fact, the story became a television feature film called Nightmare in Columbia County, which was aired in primetime on CBS. Well, her sister Dawn at least thought after the trial was over and the man had been sentenced that her nightmare would be over, and she thought she could move on, and she tried to move on. She tried to forget about it. A few years later, she got a letter in the mail, and it was from this killer. And this letter forever changed her life because he had written to Dawn in his prison cell, and this was the question that he asked her in the letter. Dear Dawn, will you and your family ever forgive me for what I did to your sister? Now, I want to ask all of us, the tough question. Would you? If somebody had done that to your sister or your grandson or your granddaughter or your mom or your dad or your wife or your husband and years later after they had shown no remorse, no regret, heard nothing from them after all these years, you get a letter in the mail, would you forgive me for what I did? To you would you forgive them according to a time magazine article that was written several years ago most of us probably would not this article was entitled should all be forgiven and in this article it contained a survey where people were asked whether or not they would forgive someone who did the following things for example 
Would you forgive someone who murdered someone in your community? 33% said yes. 59% said no. Would you forgive someone who raped you? 22% said yes. 73% said no. Would you forgive someone who raped a member of your family? 19% said yes. 77% said no. Would you forgive someone who murdered your child? 15% said yes. 81% said no. Now, I realize that few of us in this room or listening right now have experienced the type of emotional and spiritual earthquake as Dawn Smith Jordan has, but the truth is, most all of us in this room at one time or another, or maybe even as I'm speaking, have experienced a relational earthquake, a marriage that was mangled by adultery, a friendship that was fractured by disloyalty, a partnership that was poisoned by dishonesty. And what we've been saying in this series we've been doing is whatever, whenever these earthquakes takes place, somebody is always at fault at fault because, as you know, physical earthquakes are caused by faults. And so whenever a, re a relationship gets off track, whenever a friendship is fractured or a marriage goes the wrong way, somebody's always at fault. Sometimes we've said it's my fault, not yours. I'm the one that broke it. Sometimes it's not your fault, it's mine. Sometimes it's not my fault, it's yours. It works both ways. There are times when a relationship goes wrong and I'm the one that caused it, I'm the one that broke it, I'm the one that needs to fix it. And then we've said, we've kind of flipped the scenario and said, yeah, that's one thing, but what about those times in a relationship when it's not your fault? It's their fault. You're not the one that broke it. You're not the offending party. You are the offended party. Well, what we've been learning is when you study God's Word, God is not interested in fixing the blame. God is interested in fixing the problem. As a matter of fact, whenever a relationship is ruptured between fellow Christians, people who claim to be followers of Jesus, We've been learning that both parties have a responsibility to seek reconciliation. So what we did in the first part of this series was we said, okay, let's take this scenario where it's your fault, not theirs. You're the one that ruined the relationship. You're the one that broke it. What do you do? You're the offender. Well, in that case, Jesus said this. He said, so if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, that is, you did something wrong, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So Jesus said, and it's pretty obvious, everybody would agree with this, if I'm the one that broke it, I ought to be the one to fix it. No problem. Now, we flip the scenario. What about if it's their fault, not yours? You're not the one that, 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 that offended the, per, the other person. They're the ones that offended you. You're not the one that broke it. They did. Well, Jesus said, this applies. If your brother sins against you, it's their fault. You are still to go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, that's an amazing thing. Jesus said, even if you're not the offending party, you're the offended person, you ought to take the initiative, you ought to go, and you ought to fix it. And so what we said was over the last couple of weeks, we said there are several steps you've got to take when you need to fix a problem you didn't even create to begin with. We said, first of all, you've got to take the step of confrontation. Even though we didn't break it, we've got to take the first step of fixing it. And what I said was a couple of weeks ago, we don't tend to do this. When somebody hurts you, you don't go tell somebody else that somebody's hurt you. You go to the person that's hurt you. You go to the person that's offended you. You do it privately. You do it personally. And you go to them not for the purpose of revenge, but with the hope of restoration and reconciliation. You're trying to put that relationship back together. And then last week, we said after the step of confrontation, you need to take the step of elimination. What we said was, just as God has canceled our sin debt, we've got to be willing to cancel the sin debt of other people. Now today, we've saved this message for last. Now we get into the real nitty-gritty of forgiveness. Because I've been trying to motivate all of us to get into a forgiving mode and be willing to forgive those who have hurt us or be willing to try to get forgiveness if we've hurt others. But what we're going to do today is we're going to really delve into, so how do you do that? Because there's a right way to forgive and there's a wrong way to forgive. And if you give, forgive people the wrong way, you really haven't forgiven them. Because you see, I realize some of you are sitting right there and you're saying to yourself, 
I know I really do need to forgive this person that's hurt me. And that's one thing. And I know there's some of you sitting there this morning and you're saying, you know, I really want to forgive that person that's hurt me. I understand that. But now we're learning it's a whole different matter to say, I am going to forgive that person that's hurt me. And what we're going to share today is that the third and final step you've got to take to forgive someone who's wronged you is the step of reciprocation. I'm going to explain that. This is what this whole message is about. This little principle, it's a big principle, it's a key principle, is found in a little book in the New Testament called Ephesians. So if you've brought a copy of God's Word or an iPhone or a smart pad or whatever, I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to look at two short verses today, but we're going to learn a great biblical principle about the motivation of forgiveness and the method of forgiveness. We're going to learn today why we ought to be willing to forgive no matter what someone has done to us, and we're going to learn how to do that in the right way. Now, before we get into this, let me go ahead and tell you what some of you or a lot of you have already figured out, okay? What I've been telling you over the last five weeks is simple. It's not profound. It's stuff you've heard before. I don't claim to have given any of you revelation of truth. What I've been sharing with you over the last several weeks, they are very simple steps, but they're very difficult. They're gut-wrenching. Because I'm asking some of you to walk away from things that I would be the first one to admit I've never experienced. Because I know some of you are sitting there, and I'm going to tell you about a lady at the end of this message that just talked to me outside just a while ago. I'm going to tell you right now, if you've been sexually abused, I haven't. I can't relate to you. If you've been financially abused, if somebody's taken advantage of you and left you holding the bag financially, I really haven't experienced that. If you had a spouse that walked out on you and left you having to raise the kids and pay the mortgage, I haven't experienced that. And I promise you, there are a lot of you in this room, and I would not have a defense. You could come up and you could lay me out right now. You could say, let me tell you what you're asking me to forgive. I bet you've never had to forgive something like that, and you're exactly right. And all I could look at you and say is, you're right. I've never had to forgive that. I cannot relate in a way to what you are going through. I am not saying this is easy. It is very difficult. This is the one thing I'm going to ask you to remember. It's what I want you to take out the door with you when you leave. I choose to forgive others just as God has forgiven me. I choose to forgive others just as God has forgiven me. Now, in these two little short verses, Paul gives us two very simple, but I'm telling you now, they are extremely difficult steps to take if you are ever going to get out of the prison you've been in that you built yourself and really begin now to move on with your life. Two steps. Number one, Paul said, we need to eliminate bitterness. We've got to eliminate bitterness. Now, listen to Ephesians 4, verse 31. Paul says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander. It's like he's saying, let me think of everything that might be in your dirty, sinful heart right now, okay? Let all of this stuff be put away from you. And then he says, let's kind of wrap it up along with all malice. Now, there's a reason why Paul says this. You cannot bear the fruit of forgiveness until you cut out the root of bitterness. I'm going to say that again. You cannot bear the fruit of forgiveness until you cut out the root of bitterness. Now, another version translates the verse this way. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Now, let me just kind of state something I know is obvious. I know that sounds kind of weird. And let me tell you what I mean by that. I want you to imagine that you came into my office to see me, and you're looking for some profound advice. So you come in and you sit down and, and, and you say, Pastor, I've got a problem. And, and I say, well, well, what is your problem? And you say, well, I've got all this bitterness and all of this anger and all of this rage and, and all of this clamor and all of this slander in my heart. What should I do about it? And what if I just looked at you and said, uh, get rid of it next? <laughs> you know what? You'd be bitter toward me. You'd be angry with me. Are you kidding me? I've got all this stuff. In, I've, I've carried this stuff. And you're just saying just get rid of it? How do you do that? How do you just get rid of it? How do you just put it away? By the way, the word get rid of literally means to remove or to separate yourself from something. Here's a picture of what Paul was saying. How many of you have ever walked into a spider web? Ever done that? How many of you ever done that? 
If you've ever done that, the first time you do that, you automatically know what the word anachronophobia means, right? You, nobody has to tell you what that is. You know what that word means for the rest of your life, okay? Now, somebody tell me, when you walk into a spider web, what's, what, what do you immediately start doing? Oh, man, you're just clawing and you're pulling and you're, I mean, anything that's not a spider web's coming off. It's, I mean, right? It's coming off. You want to get rid of every, and I mean, there's a sense of urgency. You're not doing this casually. I mean, you are really getting everything. You're pulling at everything. If it looks like a spider web, it's coming off. That's the picture that Paul's using. That's, the, that's, the, that's kind of the, the picture I want you to get in your mind. He says, if you've got any of these things attached to you, bitterness and rage and anger, you need to get it off you. By the way, you notice all these vices that Paul lists? It's kind of like he's trying to think of every single fault that we might have that can cause a relational earthquake that would make forgiveness almost impossible. And he says, okay, if you're harboring anything like this in your heart, lose it, drop it, get rid of it. And oh, by the way, you notice he starts with bitterness. There's a reason he does this. By the way, Paul would have made a great psychologist. I want you to watch this. There's a reason why Paul starts with bitterness. The word bitterness originally meant something that was sharp or something that was pointed. Now, if you've got any bitterness in your heart, you can relate to this. Bitterness is kind of like a knife that you carry with you. And if you ever meet that person that did you wrong, you want to stick them with it. Bitterness is kind of like a spear that you carry with you. And if you ever meet that person that really messed you over, you want to run them through with it. Bitterness is kind of like a sword that you carry in a sheath. And every time, if you ever meet up with that person, you want to take that sword and you want to run them through with it. Because, and and see, Paul's advice is real simple. He says, if you have any bitter feelings toward anybody, get rid of them. Are you still mad? You're still upset? You're still angry over something someone did to you? Paul would say, stop it. Do you still find yourself sometimes, let's be honest, is there anyone right now that just for maybe 30 seconds, you would like to hang over a vat of hot acid by their toenails. Anybody like that at all? You say, yeah, I, I, I know that person. Paul would say, well, quit it. And you're sitting there and you're going, huh. well, that's easy for Paul to say. Not really. When, when Paul wrote these words, he was sitting in a Roman jail cell, unjustly incarcerated, unfairly treated, Matter of fact, he would never get out of the jail cell alive. He would eventually be beheaded. And yet, here's a man who's in jail for doing nothing except preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he is pleading for all bitterness and all rage and all resolved anger to be flushed from your heart. Now, you're sitting there and you're saying, well, I'll tell you, I just can't do that. Because, I'll just be honest with you, Paul's a lot more spiritual than I am. Well, let's just say that if Paul is a lot more spiritual than you are. That doesn't matter because getting rid of bitterness is not just a matter of being spiritual. It's a matter of being smart. And I hope take this the right way. In a way, bitterness is stupidity. And let me tell you why. Bitterness is an acid that eats its own container. Bitterness is a cancer that destroys its own body. I love this definition. Somebody said bitterness is like drinking poison and then waiting for the other person to die. I mean, think about it. You're, you're, you're here right now, and you're thinking about this person right now, that's, that's whoever it is, ex-spouse, ex-this, ex-that, mom, dad, stepmother, stepfather, whatever, and you are so bitter toward that person. You wake up and you think about that person. You'll see something and think about that person, or you'll hear something, and those bad memories come back, and you think about all the anger and rage you've got toward that person. I want you to think about this. Has it ever occurred to you that when you're bitter toward someone, you're thinking about that person? Well, has it ever occurred to you that when you're thinking about them, they're not thinking about you? Some of you went to bed last night. You couldn't even go to sleep because you were so bitter toward that person that hurt you. They slept like a baby. There's some of you so bitter, you got indigestion. You can't even eat. They're picking out. They don't care about you. See, the problem with bitterness is it will control you. It will consume you. It will eat you up. It, it, it will absolutely ruin you. How, how many of you are from the deep south? You, you were born in the deep south, okay? All right, the rest of you who need to be saved, I want you to hear this. <laughs> down in the deep south, down in the deep south, we have a plant that grows down here. It's indigenous to the south. It's called kudzu. Now, let me tell you about kudzu. 
Kudzu is the only part of the world that was not created by God. Even God would not create kudzu. God's too good to create kudzu. I am absolutely convinced the devil created kudzu. I, I really believe this. I believe the only plant that will grow in hell is kudzu because not even fire can kill kudzu. You cannot get rid of kudzu. You never want to have kudzu around your house. It grows like wildfire. It takes over everything that it can. Now, if you've ever seen kudzu, I want you to get this in your mind. Bitterness is like, an emotion, like, it's like emotional kudzu. It will wrap its tentacles around your heart and around your mind and around your soul. And it will literally suck the joy and the happiness and the peace and the contentment right out of your life. So you're sitting there and you're saying, I get that, I understand it, but how do you eliminate it? How do you get rid of it? How do you pull it out of your heart? Well, I read a story the other day and I thought, this is, this is such a great picture, I'll share it with you. I was reading the other day, I don't even know the book I was reading, but I read this story, true story. It's about a man that was a hiker and he loved to hike through like exotic places in the world. And he wanted to hike through the, the jungles of Burma. So he hired a guide and they were hiking through the jungles of Burma and they came to this river. It was a very shallow river, but it was a very wide river. And so they waded through it, but when they got to the other side, when they came out of the river, there were leeches, numerous leeches that, that had, had grabbed onto this man's torso and this man's legs and his arms. And his first instinct was to do what we would do. His first instinct was to reach down and to pull those leeches off. As he went to reach for the first leech, the guide grabbed his hand and stopped him and said, don't do that. Do, do not tear that leech out. He said, why not? He said, because you will leave tiny pieces of that leech under your skin, and infection will set in, and it could kill you. And so the, the man said to the guide, well, how do you get rid of a leech? And he said, you're not going to believe it, but he said, it's, I'll tell you the best way to do it. He said, the best way to do it is to get into a very warm balsam bath, get into a tub of warm balsam bath water. And he said, what good will that do? He said, there's something in that warm balsam water that just calms those leeches down. He said, they'll relax. They'll release their hold on your body. And he said, you can just gently pull them off and you won't leave any residue under your skin. And I read that story and I thought to myself, you know, if you're out there this morning and somebody has hurt you and you've got these leeches of bitterness attached to your heart and to your soul and to your mind, if you think you can just kind of rip them off and just kind of expect that you'll be ready to forgive, you won't because you know what will happen? You'll leave pieces of resentment under the surface of your heart. And at the wrong time, or you might say the right time, they'll boil back up and they'll be there all over again. And here's what I want you to hear. The only way to get rid of bitterness is begin to bathe yourself in the warm waters of God's grace and begin to bathe yourself in the warm waters of God's forgiveness. And you know what will happen? That, those, those tentacles of bitterness, they'll begin to relax and they'll begin to let go. And you can very spiritually but yet very easily take them out of your heart. But now that raises a question. Why should I even try to do that? Why should I even try to get rid of my bitterness? How in the world can I even get there? Well, here's the secret. This is important. The secret is found in the next verse in two words. Listen to this. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Now, I want to leave that up there for a moment because I want to show you something. The two most important words in that scripture are those two words. Paul says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. And then he says, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Just as. Huge words. Paul says, you want to know the motivation for forgiveness? Would you like to know the method of forgiveness? Would you like to know the model of forgiveness? Would you, would you like to know why you ought to be a forgiving person and how to be a forgiving person? It's all found in those two words, just as. As I choose to forgive others just as God has forgiven me. So, step one, you eliminate bitterness, right? Step two, you demonstrate forgiveness. Now, notice the first thing Paul says again. Paul was a great psychiatrist. He would have been an absolutely fantastic counselor. He knew what he was doing. Because notice the first thing he says in verse 32. He says, be kind to one another. Now, why would he start off by saying, be kind to one another, all right? Think about it. For every negative, there is a, right? For every action, there is a 
Everybody got that? Negative, positive, action, reaction. Here's the amazing thing. You'll, you'll find this to be true. I find it to be true in my life. I, I can't explain it. It's just kind of a spiritual law. When you eliminate bitterness, you will activate kindness. I, 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 don't, I don't know how that works, but it just works. When you eliminate bitterness, you will activate kindness. Here's a good illustration. Have you ever met a kind, bitter person? No, they, they don't exist. They're not out there. There is something about bitterness that says, I have nothing to do with kindness. And there's something about kindness that says, I have nothing to do with bitterness. Now, you know why? Look at the next thing Paul says. Be tenderhearted. Why would Paul say that? What do you think bitterness does to your heart? Somebody tell me. Hardens it. Bitterness hardens your heart. Kindness softens the heart. Forgiveness softens the heart. And then Paul hits us with the punchline. He says, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Now, we're going to plant there for the next few minutes. We're going to wrap this up. Watch this. That statement is both profoundly simple and it is simply profound. Paul says, look, the basic reason why you ought to be a forgiving person is because you are a forgiven person person. Only forgiven people are motivated to forgive. You forgive because you are forgiven, and you are forgiven because Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and came back from the dead so that you could be forgiven, okay? Now, hang with me. I want you to listen to this next statement. I'm, in fact, I'm going to read it twice. It's so important. Listen to this. You will never be able to forgive someone else for what they have done to you until you remember how God has forgiven you for what you have done to him. You will never be able to forgive someone else for what they have done to you until you remember how God has forgiven you for what you have done to him. I got news for some of you in this room right now. If you keep focusing on that person that's hurt you, you'll never get over it. If you keep focusing on what they did to you, you'll never forgive it. If you keep focusing on what they are, who they are, what they did, when they did it, how they did it, you're going to live in a prison of bitterness that you built yourself, and you'll never get out of it till the day you die. You have got to take your focus off the person that's hurt you, and you've got to start focusing on the one who has forgiven you even though you hurt him. And until you do that, you will never get to the place where you can replace forgiveness or bitterness with forgiveness. Now, that's the motivation of forgiveness, but what is the method of forgiveness? See, Paul, again, Paul's such a great counselor. So you're, you're sitting in Paul's office, and you're going, okay, all right, I'll do it. I'll go forgive that person. You start to get up, and Paul says, no, we're not done. We're not finished. Well, what do you mean? So how are you going to forgive them? Well, what do you mean, how am I going to forgive them? Well, how are you going to forgive them? Well, I'm just going to go and say you're forgiven. Paul says, that's not forgiveness. It's not, no. No, there's a, there's a certain way you have to forgive someone or that's not forgiveness. And you say, well, how am I supposed to forgive? He says, exactly the same way God's forgiven you. Well, then that raises the big question, right? So how has God forgiven me? Well, let me share with you three quick ways. First, God forgives us freely. God forgives us freely. Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, didn't charge me one dime to do that. He didn't charge us anything. He came to the cross free of charge. He didn't extract a pound of flesh. He didn't take his revenge first. He didn't come to the cross and he didn't say, now before I die for you, you're going to pay me what you owe me. Then I'll die for you. He didn't come to me and say, now, James, you clean your life up, you get your act together, then I'll die for you. Nope. He said, James, I'm dying for you free of charge because I want to forgive you free of charge. And what Paul says is this, the way God forgives us is the way we have to forgive other people. No strings attached, no fine print in the contract, no conditions. We forgive freely. Second way God forgives us is this. God forgives us fully. Fully. Forgiveness is not fractional. Do, do you understand? Do you, do you, I want you to really get this now. Do you understand 
That if God all of a sudden refused to forgive one part of one fraction of one decimal point of one sin, none of us in this room could be forgiven. None of us in this room could have eternal life. God not only forgives all of our sins, plural, God forgives all of our sin, singular. Now, let me give you an illustration you don't know what I'm talking about. According to every statistic I've read, one out of every two people in this room are going to get cancer. One out of two of us are going to get some type of cancer. Now, I want you to imagine you're one of those two. You go to your doctor and your doctor says, uh, look, I got bad news for you. What's the bad news? Well, we did all your blood work. We've done the x-rays, done the MRIs, and you've got a tumor in your body. Now, the moment your doctor tells you that, you don't say to your doctor, well, how did that tumor get there? You, you don't say to that doctor, now, who's to blame for my tumor? You, you don't say to that doctor, can I live with it? What are you going to ask your doctor? Can, I, can you get this out of me? Can, can you take this out of me? I, I want this thing out. Now, suppose your doctor looks at you and he says, uh, Here's the good news. We can get the tumor out. We can get it all. But you do need to understand this. For that entire tumor to be taken out, it's going to cost you everything you have. Your insurance won't cover it all. So if I take this tumor out, you're going to lose your house. You're going to lose your 401K. You're going to lose your savings. You're going to lose the furnishings in your house. You're going to lose every single thing you have. So maybe you ought to go home and think about it and come back and let me know what you want to do. Now, do you honestly think you'd go back to that doctor and you'd say, what would you charge for half a tumor? <laughs> well, you wouldn't do that. Matter of fact, you wouldn't even have to leave. You would say, oh, there's no need to leave, doctor. I don't care what it costs me. I want the tumor out, all out. And what Paul is saying is, God expects the same thing of us. When we forgive, he says, okay, I want all that they did to you forgiven. I want all of their sin forgiven. I want all of your bitterness to be removed. When we forgive, we forgive fully. And then the last thing that God, we, we learn is this. God forgives us finally. He forgives us freely. He forgives us, fully. He forgives us finally. When God forgives, God forgives. In other words, God, when God forgives, He keeps no record of past wrongs. He doesn't carry a briefcase full of grudges. When God cancels the debt, He burns the note. And that's exactly what God expects of us. He says, okay, do you really want to forgive this person that hurt you? Yes, Lord, I really do. You've got to do it freely. You've got to do it fully. You've got to do it finally. You've got to come to a point where you say to yourself and you say to the other person, I am never going to bring this up to you again. This is over. It's done. It's canceled. You can't be... Like two brothers, I, I, uh, uh, th their name was Timmy and Johnny. They were playing upstairs. And it's just before bedtime, Tommy hits Johnny with his stick. Well, a terrific fight breaks out. They're up there going at it. Mom, here's what's going on. She rushes up there, separates the two of them. She says, okay, tell me what happened. She finds out what happens. She pulls Johnny outside the room. She said, now, Johnny, Timmy hits you with a stick, right? Yes, ma'am, he hit me with a stick. So he started it. Yeah, he started it. She says, okay, now, Johnny, I want you to hear this. Before you go to bed, you're going to have to forgive Timmy for what he did because you might die tonight. Johnny thought about it for a moment. He said, well, okay, Mom. He said, I'll forgive Jimmy tonight, but if I don't die tonight, he better watch out in the morning. <laughs> now, that ain't forgiveness. That is not forgiveness. When you forgive, it is final. So I didn't end with the story of Dawn Smith Jordan that I told you at the beginning. So what did she do? How did she respond to, man, to the man who raped and brutalized and sodomized and strangled her sister? Well, Dawn Smith Jordan said she, actually, she reacted like most of us would react when she got that letter. First, she was angry. She was even ticked off that this guy had the audacity to write her and ask her to begin with. Then she really got mad when she thought about, you're asking me to do something that's really going to cost me. It's not going to cost you anything. And then she began to get frustrated because she knew she was a believer in Jesus. And then she got irritated because she knew what God wanted her to do, but she didn't want to do it. And she did not think she could do it. 
And she's driving down the road. And this exact verse popped into her heart. Be kind and tenderhearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And before that man was electrocuted, she did correspond with him. She said, I do forgive you. I forgive you freely. I forgive you fully. And I forgive you finally. So I want to wrap up with this. Just before I walked in here, a lady stopped me outside, one of our faithful members here. She said, you got a minute? I just got to tell you something. I said, sure. She said, you've been talking to me for six weeks. She said, I was physically and sexually abused by a relative who was a deacon in our church. She said, I've been verbally abused. I've been financially abused. I've been emotionally abused. You name every way you could be abused. I've been abused. She said, I carried that with me for 61 years years because ever since I was abused as a three year old girl I've lived with this and she said I just want you to know and she kind of threw her hands out like this she said there's nothing like being set free from the prison of peace and I'm saying to all of you this morning and I want to say this as sympathetically as I can no, I don't know what I'm asking of you. I don't know how gut-wrenching it's going to be, and I don't know how difficult it's going to be. I get that. I'm just simply telling you this. We all have faults. They're going to cause tremors. that are going to cause relational earthquakes. Sometimes it's going to be their fault, not yours. Sometimes it's going to be your fault, not theirs. Either way, I'm simply telling you, you can shock-proof your life, and you can move on and live the life that God wanted you to do you can choose to forgive others just as God in Christ has forgiven you. This October, join Dr. James Merritt and friends in beautiful Branson, Missouri for the 2021 Mountaintop Conference. This Ozark City offers something for everyone from world-class dining and live entertainment to unique shopping and outdoor recreation. There is an adventure waiting for you. This event will feature powerful preaching daily from Dr. Merritt, Joining him will be his friends, Bellevue Baptist Dr. Steve Gaines and First Baptist Concord's Dr. Jim Collier. You will also get to hear from the legendary Oak Ridge Boys when they stop by to share some of their story. Enjoy incredible music from Grammy Award winning Guy Penrod and one of Christian music's biggest artists, Crowder. Visit mountaintopconference.com for all the details and reserve your spot today. the lives of the lost and enriching the faith of the found. This is Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. This broadcast is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts. 